Welcome to the Landmarks Chambers webinar, Delivering Major Infrastructure, Part 5, Land Compensation, Assessing the Claim. We are delighted to see so many of you joining the session today, and we hope you will find the presentations and discussion to be useful and informative. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Lean. I'll be chairing the session today, uh, joined by my colleagues Simon Pickles and Luke Wilcox, and our guest speaker Colin Smith, all of whom I'll formally introduce in a moment. To begin with, just a few housekeeping points to note. Um, firstly, your microphones are automatically muted, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. Secondly, we very much welcome questions throughout the session. Please submit them via text in the Q&A section, which may be found at the top or bottom of your screen. We will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. This webinar will be recorded. You will receive a link to the presentation on the recording shortly after the event concludes. And if your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, we invite you to rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link once more. Moving to the speakers for today. Um, our first speaker, um, Luke, uh, is a barrister at Landmark Chambers. He practices across uh, a range of areas of law the common thread of his practice is valuation. Uh, he deals with valuation issues regularly and in a range of contexts, including CPO compensation, rent review and rating. He's acted in numerous valuation disputes in the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber and as a rating specialist has appeared four times in the Supreme Court. Our second speaker, um, Simon Pickles, was uh, initiated into compensation as junior counsel in the Shun Fung case. Uh, and a significant proportion of his practice thereafter has involved advice in particular to claimants and requiring authorities on compensation matters. Um, he was part of the team that petitioned against the High Speed Rail London to West Midlands Bill, the HS2 Phase 1, in respect of the proposed temporary possession and use of some buildings at Euston Station. And he sent me his proudest moment in this context, which he identifies as being probably paddle and paddle, the scope of Rule 6 and its relationship with Rule 2. Um, our guest speaker today um, is Colin Smith, uh, a fellow of the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a photograph of Colin and due to technical difficulties, he'll be joining us by audio only. Um, we're not sure if he's deliberately cultivating um, a, a reputation as an international land of mystery, but you will hear but not see uh, Colin today. He is very experienced in compulsory acquisition and compensation issues for large infrastructure projects. Um, he, I was going to say he will no doubt be recognised by some, perhaps his name and voice will be recognised by some as the promoter's expert witness on land acquisition and compensation matters through the parliamentary proceedings on the Crossrail Bill and on the, the bills for High Speed 2, both Phase 1 uh, and Phase 2A. Uh, but I should stress that uh, Colin is appearing today in his personal capacity as an experienced surveyor and not as a representative of either of those two projects. Finally, um, I'm Jacqueline Bean, a barrister at Landmark Chambers. Uh, similar to Luke, I practice across a range of Chambers areas of work, land use, land regulation being the common theme. And um, without further ado, I will pass on to Luke. Well, thank you very much, Jacqueline, and good morning, everyone. It's very nice to uh, see so many people here, and I can only apologise that I've got far less hair now than I did at the time that my chamber's photo was taken. I can assure you that's uh, nothing to do with the stresses of practice. Now, I'm going to give a general introduction to uh, the principles of valuation as they apply in the uh, compensation setting, I thought it's worth beginning by having a little think about what valuation is actually, uh, what it's like as a subject in this area. I know that we've got a number of surveyors listening in, but also a number of solicitors and the relationship between valuation and law and their respective roles is something which is of critical importance in getting things right in this area. As uh, we, we all know, valuation is as much an art as a science. It involves very significant elements of professional judgment on the part of the valuer, as well as the application of more scientific uh, analytical methods, which go into understanding how comparables work, for instance. 
the role of the law in this area is to set the framework within which the valuer has to answer the questions which are put to them. Uh, valuation is uh, something which can't be done in the abstract. You can't simply instruct someone to value a property full stop. You have to know value it in respect of what date. Are you valuing it in respect of its capital value or its rental value or something else? All of those questions are what the law is there to do. We establish the hypothesis within which the valuer works. Once that hypothesis is established, the role of law as a body of precedent essentially falls away. I've put up there a quote from a, a fairly well-known rating case, which summarises the principle very cleanly. Now, I've used the rating case, not a CPO case, for, for a reason, and that is that valuation law uh, evolves in a number of areas. You, know, you have rating, you've got uh, rent review, you've got things like the 1954 Act, landlord and tenant, lease renewals, all those sorts of areas. And one of the roles of the lawyer, I think, is to, is to assist in how those areas can cross-fertilise one another. Sometimes you can search in vain in your CPO textbooks for an answer to a problem, which will be instantly familiar to a practitioner of rent review, say. Uh, so the ability to pull in cases from other areas is something which, which can be of value in this area. And I'll be doing that on a few occasions in my talk. Turning then to the framework which the law establishes for valuation for CPO compensation purposes. Section 5 of the 1961 Act is your starting point. Everyone will be familiar with the six rules which it sets up. The difficulty we have now is that there are actually seven <laughs> rules since uh, 2017 an additional rule was inserted that's uh, what i've summarized on the slide there is the no scheme world rule this is numbered though rule 2a so what we all know as rules 5 and rule 6 and so on uh, those numbers have remained in place Looking very briefly at the rules, I mean, we could spend an entire day talking about each of them, frankly, but in, in absolute bullet point summary. The first principle you've got here, rule one, is that you don't give an allowance for the fact that the owner of the land is being deprived of their land without their say. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, for a time, there was a thought that you get some sort of additional element added on for the uh, sort of distress and inconvenience of the compulsory taking. That's no longer the case. What you have to assume is that the seller is willing to sell the land. Which brings us straight into rule two, which in some ways is the most important of the rules. What you are aiming to do is to work out the open market value of the land as uh, understood by the willing seller. So you have a hypothetical sale with a hypothetical willing seller. We'll come on to a little more to the hypothetical nature of the exercise later. Rule 2A, the new one which was added to the statutory scheme, though the rule itself is very much older, is uh, what I've summarised as the no scheme world rule. Section 6, capital A of the 1961 Act sets up an additional series of rules for how to do no scheme world valuation. But in, in essence, what you have to do is to ignore any increase or decrease in the value of the land uh, in which you're valuing which is referable to the fact that it's being compulsorily acquired. That if the land suddenly gets a load of uh, ransom value because it's essential for the delivery of the scheme, say, that's left out of account. Similarly, if the prospect of the scheme caused a dramatic collapse in property markets, uh, property values in the area, which can and does happen, that has to be left out of account as well, largely. Rule three, no special suitability. So if you if you have a piece of land which is of particular importance to the statutory acquirer because they want to use it for something which they need their statutory powers in order to give effect to that use, then the uh, quasi ransom element which attaches to the land in those circumstances has to be disregarded as well. Uh, rule four: no value from unlawful or detrimental uses. In effect, if you are uh, putting land to a use which is unlawful in planning terms, say, 
it may be that if that use continues for another three months, it will become lawful by passage of time, say. So that in the open market, a number of bidders might be willing to take a punt on the use becoming lawful later. That sort of uh, development roll of the dice aspect, which would exist in the open market, is left out of account for CPO valuation purposes. Rule five, reinstatement value. This rule applies where you've got a use which, for which there's not really a market or there's not really an open market value, but where the user would, uh, would in good faith seek to re-establish their use of the land elsewhere. In those cases, the, the, the cost of that reinstatement, that relocation, is something which can be picked up through rule five. Classic example of this would be uh, the acquisition of a church say it's not a great market for buying churches valuing a church for use as a church is a difficult exercise rule five is designed to capture that sort of situation and finally nothing in any of the previous rules impacts on the availability of disturbance compensation i know others are going to be speaking about that later the critical thing which has to be established before you can start of any valuation is the date against which you're going to be valuing the property. Uh, the value of a property may rise or fall significantly over the course of a year or a decade. Uh, legal policy, planning policy, things like that can change as they apply to a property. The physical condition of a property may change uh, significantly from year to year. The valuation date fixes the point in time at which you're going to be considering all of those value significant factors. In the case of CPO valuation, you need to look at section 5A of the 1961 Act. That specifies the valuation date for the whole uh, range of circumstances in which a compensation valuation may fall to be made. The theme which runs through and unites all of the rules which apply to CPO compensation is what's sometimes called the principle of equivalence. This is the notion that what you're trying to do in CPO valuation is to compensate the dispossessed owner for the fullness of that person's loss and for nothing more. So the person is entitled to no more and no less than the value of what has been taken from them. I've put there a quote from uh, the, the Shang Fung case, which sets out the principle very neatly and clearly. I'm not going to read it out to you. It's, it's, it's there for you all to see. But in essence, that's what the principle of equivalence is aiming at. Valuation for these purposes is done in a, you assume, a hypothetical transaction, but in the real open market. Now, interestingly, the statute only refers to a willing seller for the land. There's no mention of a willing buyer, but it's well established in rent review uh, case law and applies equally in this context, that if what you're aiming at is an open market valuation, you have to assume a willing seller as well. If your buyer wants to, uh, uh, if, if your seller, forgive me, wants to sell, but no one wants to buy, the result will be a dramatic undercompensation. It would completely distort the open market picture you're trying to get to. So you assume willing buyer and willing seller. In rating, that's referred to as the higgling of the market, which is quite a helpful shorthand for what you're aiming at here. The expression itself comes from Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, but it's been drawn into valuation law through rating, interestingly. Another important principle here, and this underlies both the no scheme world approach and the concept of disturbance payments is what's called the value to the owner principle. In effect, what you're seeking to do is to work out what the owner has lost, not what the acquiring authority has gained. Save where the statute requires otherwise, what you are required to do here is to assume that everything accords with reality. So you only depart from the position as it actually was in the real world in as far as the statute requires you to do so. Uh, that's sometimes in the older cases referred to as valuation rebus sixtantibus. It's an expression you'll, you'll see. This is what it's referring to. 
And to finish my talk, I thought I'd very briefly touch on some of the key methods of valuation which are engaged and which apply in the CPO context. This is ultimately a matter of valuation expertise and judgment, not a matter of law. Uh, so don't, don't, uh, don't allow lawyers to tell you how to do this. But in terms of the methods you'll usually see, comparables by far the most common, find a, a property similar to yours, which has actually sold in the open market, see what it's sold for, make any adjustments for location, condition, etc. That'll give you a gauge on the value of your land. If what you're acquiring is a uh, effectively a building site, you can use residual valuation, which is where you will uh, value the land as though it had been developed in accordance with its permitted use and then deduct the cost of building out the buildings which go on it. What's left of the residue is the value of the land which is actually there. The third receipts and expenditure valuation applies uh, where there is a relationship between the earning potential of a reasonable use of the land and its open market value. What you do effectively, take the gross receipts of the actual occupier, deduct the, the expenses of the actual occupier to get a net uh, receipts, take out the reasonable dividend for the occupier, and what's left represents an annual value available for land costs that can be capitalised over the appropriate period to give an indication of capital value. Finally, uh, depreciated replacement cost valuation, uh, DRC valuation, is worth mentioning simply because it occasionally crops up, but it's pretty rare in practice. Uh, this would happen where you are, uh, where you're trying to value uh, an area where the bulk of the value rests in the buildings rather than the land, work out the cost of building new buildings of the same type, take away any uh, value detriment from the existing buildings by virtue of their age, any obsolete areas, things like that. And what you've got left will be a value of the buildings as they stand, which can stand as a proxy for the value of the land in essence. So I hope that's been a helpful introduction to the broad subject. I'm now going to pass you on to Simon, who's going to talk about some of the practical issues which can occur in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Luke. I apologise for that hiatus. Um, I'm going to deal with uh, some practical issues and um, say something about Tempe possession. Um, <clears throat> Tempe possession was on the list of topics which I was happy to take up. I have to confess that I've introduced the issue of, of dealing with some practical issues because uh, I think there are some helpful things that might just be said. I'm not going to say too much about that. Uh, but um, I'll deal with that first. Um, and let me then turn to the first of 10 slides. Uh, and so far as practical issues are concerned, <clears throat> I'd just like to say something briefly about the importance, as I see it at any rate, to both parties of claims that are both documented and explained from the outset. And all of those components are really quite important. And understanding the value for money principle not all claimants might accept the value for money principle, but it is what it is and it applies and I need to say something about it. <clears throat> but I think that getting, uh, getting claimants to understand and accept the value for money principle is helpful from the outset. Um, the slide also shows a clear strategy towards offers of settlement. I'm not going to deal with that, it's entirely my fault that it's there, it's vestigial uh, and I'm just going to deal briefly with the first two points. So if we just dwell for a moment on the first of those two points. <clears throat> David Albin referred in his presentation to the, um, the guide, the 2019 guidance, uh, which sets out very, so very clearly uh, and discusses the various statutory powers uh, pursuant to which CPOs might be um, made and authorised. Uh, that guidance also refers by link to a, a model claim <clears throat> and it's a model claim uh, that is specifically designed uh, to be uh, used in the concept of ap applications for advanced payments. You'll be aware that section 52 of the 73 Act, Land Compensation Act 73, provides for advanced payments. 
And that guidance provides you with a, with respect, very, very simple basic model claim. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, time-wise at any rate, is the land chamber practice direction uh, of 2010, uh, which remains in force available online. And there's a paragraph in that dealing with statements of case, uh, advising that they should be documented and explanatory with a particular emphasis, it has to be said, on making things clear for the tribunal and the tribunal's own um, identification of what the issues are. And what, I, what I'm going to suggest, in, so far as this practical point is concerned, is, is, that, is that really, uh, in effect, what, what uh, the practice direction advises later on in the stage would not be a bad idea uh, as a rule to adopt in terms of uh, identifying and explaining the claim from the outset, whether that involves adopting the model claim and adding an appendix to it um, is a matter of form, but it does seem to me that uh, a great deal of time and effort uh, on both sides can be, can be um, saved um, if these things are flushed out from the very beginning. The claimant's interest in this is very straightforward. The claimant, really, after, pose after possession's been taken of his land, will, will want some money. And he will want some money to enable him to, to, to move if he hasn't done it already. Uh, or, or at any rate, to make sure that he's, not, he's out of pocket for as little time as possible. And so it's really important from the claimant's point of view uh, that he puts his best foot forward in, in terms of identifying, firstly, the basis of his claim. Uh, and secondly, the quantum of his claim. And uh, so far as um, the costs of claim are concerned, the costs of claim, provided obviously that they're reasonably incurred, are invariably recoverable. And, uh, and, and it does seem to me that claimants should be willing at the outset to, to, to invest, frankly, in the costs of claim reasonably, uh, and to make sure that they um, achieve as much value out of those, that early expenditure. The AA's interest in this, the acquiring authority's interest, is very straightforward. It needs to dispose of claims efficiently, and that will be promoted if it encourages claimants uh, to um, put together substantive claims from the outset. And it will also enable it uh, to make uh, more informed choices and decisions about sealed offers further down the line. So, what are some examples of, uh, of, of what's involved in this. Now, but I'll just step back before I look at these examples. What I'm essentially, what I'm essentially emphasizing is, is the necessity from the very beginning to have a narrative and, 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 and maybe even a chronology to use a JR tool from the very outset uh, so that the facts uh, and, the, and the, the chronology of events and what has reasonably taken place hopefully in terms of identifying, for example, relocation premises, is explained from the outset. And so that from the outset, uh, the, the claim it is addressing from the outset, the reasonableness uh, component of the Schumfung test. So if we look at these examples here, if, if we're looking at a business relocation, you would be looking for an identification or an explanation of the premises search who undertook it, why they were chosen, what their search parameters were, uh, and, and factors that informed their selection. And, and those will obviously include uh, location, quality of accommodation, comparison of, of the premises and their location uh, with the property taken. Another example of, of what needs to be dealt with and, uh, up front, and I've raised this and I've identified this because it's problematical is management time. Again, uh, there's often confusion about what, what can be claimed under management time, and sometimes it's used, it's it purportedly used really as a vehicle for more compensation in effect. And, and it does involve an element of judgment. But what is it essentially about um, is, is, the, is, is, is the cost or the, the loss incurred by the claimant for the uh, diversion of its management capacity for the purposes of, 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 of constituting a claim. 
And so, the, so if one's going to make a, a substantial management time claim, you, you're going to need to talk and identify who was involved in managing the claim on behalf of the claimant, how much time was involved, what, what was involved in, in that exercise. And then most important, and most, so far as management time is concerned, you're going to have to quantify or have a stab at quantifying the loss resulting from that staff deployment. So that if you take, for example, a company or a partnership, you're not looking to come. You're not looking to to, to 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 compensate the individual partners or the directors uh, for the loss of their time. You're looking to compensate the claimant, which is either the partnership or the company claimant, uh, for the diversion of that time. And then finally, uh, under this, again, to be grappled with, uh, in, in my view, in, in a statement of case from the beginning is the question of mitigation. There's a duty to mitigate and um, that, is a, 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 that is a duty which appears to me to be triggered from the outset and to continue. And so what, what is important so far as mitigation is concerned, which is really a facet of the requirement to behave reasonably, uh, is, that that, is that alternatives considered uh, are spelt out uh, and that the uh, reasons for just for rejecting specific alternatives are explained. I'm going to turn then to the second point um, uh, of practical significance, which is the value for money principle. Luke was talking, Luke spoke earlier about the, the value to the owner principle and the fundamental role that that plays as an overarching principle in terms of securing that a claimant recovers not simply the market value of his land, but compensation for disturbance and any other matter not related to, 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 to the market value of his land and additional to the market value of the land. The value for the money principle operates at an altogether lower level within, as I see it, uh, within, the, within the exercise. Uh, and it's a principle that is, that is targeted specifically uh, at the principle of equivalence, and in particular, securing that a claimant recovers no more than his loss. He is entitled to recover um, his loss, but neither more nor less, as Luke emphasized. So, so the value for money principle is a rebuttable presumption that expenditure on relocation premises secures value for money, which is not always understood or accepted. And I identified two cases there which I um, not which I trot out uh, in terms of uh, providing authority for an explanation for the for the value for money principle. Service welding is a very old is an old case uh, but it's a very strong court of appeal and uh, the leading judgment was given by then Lord Justice Bridge, Bridge who explained uh, the value for money principle in a case that involved the, the relocation of a factory and the claim in that case which was in dispute and taken to the court of appeal was that that part of the claim which related to borrowing costs uh, to facilitate uh, the construction of the of the factory on the basis that the claimant wasn't able to move into ready-made premises and the the, the principle is very clearly and briefly explained in the, in the leading judgment in service welding. But there's also an interesting, uh, and there's an interesting second judgment by Lord Justice Templeman, where he puts the whole thing very simply, uh, which, is, which is that uh, on the basis that um, you can't have it both ways, or a claimant at any rate can't have it both ways. The claimant is entitled to recover and should be awarded compensation in that instance uh, for the cost of his, for, for, the, for the taking of his factory. He's not also uh, in, entitled to compensation for, 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 for acquiring and kitting out a new factory. Uh, that is uh, not what the compensation regime is about. He's recovered his loss uh, by virtue of compensation under rules what two and six in relation to the, the, the market value and relocation from the old premises is not entitled to have his cake and eat it. 
Uh, Mohammed is a, I, I use as a recent example, it's simply a working example to my mind of service welding in operation and service welding was cited and is recorded in, in, the, in the decision in, in Mohammed. Um, that was the, um, uh, re, that involved the relocation of a fish and chip shop. And the most um, fantastic element of that, uh, of that claim particularly uh, was how exaggerated it was with a claim for a, over 8 million uh, being reflecting in an ultimate award of something approaching a quarter of a million pounds. But that is simply a working example of the value for money principle in operation. And the issue arises, the issue of value, um, value for money arises typically, most typically, in respect of new or replacement fittings and equipment in, in relocation premises. But, but I think uh, that it may also arise in respect of part rental. That is to say, there isn't a hard and fast distinction between rental and other costs. If, say for the sake of argument, a factory is taken and I'm not able, I'm not able to, uh, to identify uh, convenient premises of the same size and I end up having to uh, lease prop property, lease premises that are larger than I need, then I'm not, I'm, I'm recovering, I'm recovering value for money from the rent uh, which I need to pay for the replacement premises, but I'm not, on the face of it, recovering money for excess rent in respect of space I don't need. And so there's no hard and fast uh, distinction, if you like, between the categories of categories of, of, of cost or loss in respect of which the value for money principle applies. And so, and these are simply past working examples um, that I've been involved in uh, where value for money has arisen. If I take first, the, and, the, and this illustrates a spectrum of cases really. So if I do take the builder's, the, take, take the builder's merchant, the builder's merchant who's Part, well, a builder's merchants will obviously be, is, uh, in the usual course of events, will, 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 will comprise covered space and open space, okay? So the case involves the taking of part of the yard uh, of the premises and the difficulties of identifying um, an equivalent yard space uh, in reasonable proximity to the existing one uh, involving, uh, involving the claimant uh, taking more space than he needed. Uh, and, and, and the dairy, uh, the, secondly the dairy which involved um, uh, more complex premises uh, where milk is taken in, processed and therefore the acquisition of, uh, the acquisition of equipment that was um, uh, not readily marketable and therefore didn't add value um, so far as the relocation promises of premises were concerned and the office or warehouse relocation which is a standard case. I'm going to deal very, very briefly because I'm running out of time and I apologize for that in relation to temporary position. Still not in force. These provisions uh, and it provided for in the Neighbourhood Planning Act uh, provide for a parallel power to take temporary position. So it opens up a new, new frontier for objectors. That is to say, don't take my plot or, or don't take my plot permanently. They, they can be, uh, temporary possession is authorizable by CPO it can be a blend or exclusively one or the other type of permanent or, or temporary taking. Um, and uh, the temporary possession has got to be taken within three years of the CPO. And then, and then the, the guts of the temporary possession procedures, which has yet to be brought into force, are the counter notice. Uh, because all the temporary means is not permanent. And in order to give meaning to that, uh, to the extent that it does, the counter notice entitles the, entitles the, 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 the the owner to serve notice in effect uh, asking the acquiring authority to take or to take to take for six months or 20 to, for 12 months or six months depending on the type of property um, and to either to, to do that or to withdraw and compensation in that respect is for any loss or injury to the, the, the claimant sustains uh, and that is in respect of the claimant or a beneficial claimant who is for example entitled to a right of way over the over the land that is temporarily taken or, or benefits from a restrictive covenant in respect of it. Any loss or injuries are very broad, very broad in scope. There's no spatial limitation to that phrase. There's no physical, there's no spatial limitation. There's no physical limitation. 
and so that knock-on effects on the face of it in relation to the use of other land might be taken into account. Of course, the requirement for causation and reasonableness mitigation is implicit in that. And of course, and the role of the scheme is different, it seems to me, in terms of temporary possession, because implicitly you're looking at value, value, valuing uh, the effect of temporary possession having been taken for the purposes of the scheme. There are specific provisions there on that slide which are taken from the Act, which deal specifically with business and trade disturbance. I won't go through them, but I'm not entirely clear why those expressly were provided for in, in, the, in, the, in the Act. Uh, but it seems to me that they are principles in effect that are equally applicable to any uh, disturbance claim. I'm going then to hand over to Jacqueline and Colin. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, you've teed us up nicely um, for what we're covering in this session. Uh, accommodation works, disturbance costs and Section 7 claims. And, and broadly, what we're going to cover in this session are firstly, the scope of Section 7 claims for severance and injurious affection, then looking at how accommodation works factor into your claim, and finally, disturbance costs. Uh, and there's a bit of a tag team effort. Essentially, I'm going to run through some of the, the outline legal principles uh, that apply and then hand over to Colin on each of the topics to give some practical flavour of the sort of issues that could come up and what as a what he would expect to see from uh, as part of uh, such a claim uh, and, and particular issues that he's come across uh, in his experience in these type of claims. So just firstly to, to recap section 7 of the Compulsory Purchase Act 1965 uh, which is where we find the provision for um, additional compensation uh, for impact on, on land that isn't compulsorily acquired uh, under an order or enactment um, by reason of severing the land, purchase from other land or otherwise injuriously affecting the, the land by the exercise of the powers conferred by this or the special act. So in terms of the claim under section 7, firstly in the section 7 context we are dealing with compensation that can only be claimed by a person who has had an interest in land compulsorily acquired um, in terms of injurious affection claims where no land is um, compulsorily acquired that's something that Luke will be touching on later on um, as part of section, his discussion of section 10 claims and just to note as well that it, it doesn't just apply where you acquire a sort of whole scale parcel of land but the provision can apply where, or an equivalent provision can apply, where the acquiring authority is only acquiring rights. And certainly under the, the 1976 Act that's uh, referred to there, that there's provision for compensation not just for depreciation in value and the, the, the land over which the, the right is taken, so the field has the right of way uh, on it, uh, but also can extend to depreciation in other land held with uh, that affected parcel. Uh, and to note that both this provision essentially kicks in where there's been depreciation in the value of the um, retained land. Two points to flag there. This is a depreciation in value claim. It, it's not a, a claim about things you might have to do on the land as a result of the, the scheme. Um, and uh, the, the flip side of this provision that allows uh, the person affected to claim for a diminution in the value of their other land um, is that there's also potentially need for set off for betterment uh, if in fact the retained land uh, increases in value as a result of, of the scheme or, or what's being done. So the first key principle to flag is that a section 7 claim doesn't arise in respect of all or any retained land so it doesn't apply where you've got a you know I have land you've taken some of my land I've got a claim in respect of the, the whole remainder of my land it only applies to, to other land that essentially held there with the acquired land. Um, the term held there with doesn't appear in section 7, but obviously it comes through from the, the case law that previously has, has dealt with these issues and the, the predecessor acts, as it were. And to flag there that, firstly, a commonality of ownership isn't sufficient in and of itself, so it can't be, I own all of this land, please can I have some compensation? Um, that's, not a, that's not enough of a factor. And it's neither necessary nor sufficient uh, for the 
that the parcel of land that's acquired and the parcel of land in respect to which you're saying well it's been depreciated in value to be held under the same title and the case has been pretty clear that the fact it might be in separate titles doesn't mean that it doesn't count as being other land held therewith and suddenly the fact it's in the same title isn't enough in and of itself and there's various extracts from different cases that are often put forward as as it's really encapsulating the principle of a section seven claim. I quite like this one from, from Lord Sumner in a Privy Council case, um, which is that the basis of the claim must be that the lands taken are so connected with or related to the lands left mm -hmm. that, the, um, that the owner is prejudiced in his ability to use or dispose of them to advantage by reason of the severance. Um, and it's just worth noting as well that in terms of a severance claim, this isn't just contiguous parcels of land. And indeed, in some cases, the court said it isn't necessary for the land parcels to be contiguous, but it can apply to horizontal strata of land. So, for example, in the, the 1905 case cited there, um, it was about um, a depreciation in value of, of a parcel of land where only the subsoil had been acquired for, for railway purposes. Um, and in terms of a jury's affection, it's just worth noting that unlike a Section 10 claim, in order to establish a claim for injurious affection under Section 7, you don't have to demonstrate or establish that but for the statutory authorisation that's conferred by the Act or the Order, uh, that the works complained of would have been actionable at common law. And also just worth noting that uh, the claim isn't limited to the effect of works that are carried out on the land that's actually acquired from the claimant. It can bring in the effect of the wider works of which, um, which the acquisition forms part. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind um, that Section 8.2 of the 1965 Act makes specific provision for where you do have severance, but there's actually a very small amount of land uh, left on either side of your either your, your project. Most of it arises, I suppose, in a, in a linear transport scheme. Um, and Section 82 provides that where you're in the, the, the non-town or non-built upon environment, if you've got on either or both sides of the line a quantity of land less than half an acre, then the owner of land can actually say to look, the acquiring authority, look, you've just got to buy this. Um, and but again that's subject to whether or not there's other land in the vicinity that, that they could that the inquiry authority would be instead required to sort of essentially enable the, the landowner to to join up. I put a brief outline on the slides there and at this point which I, I hand over to Colin to uh, briefly run through some of the practical issues around uh, assessing a section seven claim, how you go about it and the sort of things that you would expect a mm -hmm. person making the claim to provide and that the acquiring authority will need to see. Hello Jacqueline, uh, hello everyone, thank you very much for uh, for that. Um, I think if you're looking at severance and injurious affection, uh, there are several issues that one has to think of. Uh, firstly, it is a, a claim for damage to land or it's to the value of land um, and it's not to be um, mixed up with a claim for disturbance. Um, Obviously, a disturbance claim or a Section 6 claim, um, which has already been referred to, is a, a loss to the owner whereby it is not covered by the value of land. Here we're talking about injury uh, to land, essentially. <clears throat> I think if we, we start with injurious affection, it's a fairly simple process. Um, you have a house and garden and uh, it's in a quiet locality and suddenly a new road or railway passes through part of that garden, bringing in noise, disturbance, visual intrusion. So that um, <clears throat> the value of the property, if you like, before the scheme and um, in the absence of the scheme is at a certain level. Uh, the value of the land taken of the garden is probably not great uh, compared with the value of the house. But of course the impact of the scheme uh, is significant upon the property and therefore it's not just the value of the garden of the land that's taken it's the whole impact on the value of the house and very often uh, it's referred to as looking at the property on a before and after basis uh, where you 
um, look at the property in the absence of the scheme and then value the property, assuming the scheme is constructed at the valuation date. And uh, that then gives a greater uh, impact <clears throat> than just the value of the land taken. Um, so yes, that's the theory. It's very easy to understand in, in some areas. There are some nuances to this. Um, for example, um, if one looks at uh, HS2 building a new railway, um, lots of land is sold, agricultural land is sold uh, alongside railways. And it doesn't seem at the moment as if that, in fact, on just purely on agricultural land is, is evidenced in the market to be depreciated. Obviously, if there's a farmhouse alongside a new railway, the same principle may apply that uh, the property is depreciated in value. Um, but it, it depends on the case, and I think it's, it's for the surveyor to carefully uh, look at the um, impact before and after the scheme um, and see the difference and to assess the, the extra depreciation over and above the value of land. Um, in terms of the, um, the slide, um, it can, of course, not just refer to agricultural land and it can refer to development land um, where, for example, um, a house, uh, sorry, a plot of land is acquired which has a particular planning consent, but a new scheme going, let's say, diagonally through part of the property means that a lesser development can be achieved uh, because of the acquisition of the land. It, it is just not a, uh, a good shape, if we, if we like it, to build the type of property that was envisaged. It may not even be um, um, a suitable uh, type of development anymore uh, because of the impact of the scheme. So all these things need to be taken into account by the surveyor. And it does depend, of course, on the uh, degree of impact that the new infrastructure has on the particular plot of land. I can only speak generally here, but I'm trying to give some ideas of um, how different situations could impact. And it's for the surveyor to look at it realistically and not to forget that he can, under section 44, claim for injurious affection that has regard to the impact of the whole scheme not just the way it impacts on the value of the land so that if something is occurring on land adjoining uh, the claimant's land that has a particular um, depreciation impact then that can be fully taken into account provided land is acquired. Um, obviously severance is a different matter and I think um, uh, severance is going to be dealt with later on Jacqueline but um, obviously severance is is where a extra depreciation occurs through the division of land and I think I'll just leave if that's enough uh, for now I'll leave you to go on to that. Thanks Colin that, that does link us neatly into the next point about accommodation works but there's just one one final practical question I think in this area which is mm -hmm. We are obviously flagged that we talk about other land held there with. You can't just go, well, I, I own this other land and there's an impact from the scheme. Therefore, I've got a Section 7 claim. Yeah. Are there any hard and fast rules that you apply about working out what is land, other land held there with? Or is it a matter of judgment? And, and who is it really has got yeah. to establish that? I, I, yes, it doesn't have to be in the same ownership. And indeed, if you're looking at a lot of farms, there they are seem to be they seem to be split up into family trusts and everything. It's a, it depends on who's who's effectively legally under control of that particular holding. Um, I think though that to be held with, if you have a separate piece of land, to, to be held with a particular piece of land. There's a number of factors. I think proximity is one thing. Um, if you have a farm in Cornwall held with a farm in Caithness, uh, it may be a little difficult to have an easy uh, linkage. So distance is a point. Um, 
I think the the use of the land obviously has is a point. You have to demonstrate that the two parcels of land are, if you like, one integrated uh, um, one integrated operation or uh, operations that are linked so that they enhance the value of the whole. In other words, the two parcels together uh, would be um, greater than the individual parts. Uh, so there's there's proximity, there's use, and there's the sort of um, planning that that um, the the same operations are carried out, and they're not separate operations. I mean, I'll give you an example. You have one arable farm, and you have a, a dairy farm just down the road in an area which is, um, let's say, pasture land and low lying. The two could act independently. Uh, even though they're both farms. So you have to look at the, the way they operate. There's Thank some you. guidance. That's really helpful. Thank you, Colin. So the the next factor to move on to, is, as, as you've mentioned, is is in the severance context. Uh, I'm, I'm only going to be very brief on this. A uh, couple of examples there. Uh, a classic, obviously, in a transport scheme will be a an overbridge or an underpass to maintain access to often agricultural land that's been severed by a road or a railway. But obviously it can extend beyond that and there's just an extract there from the HS2 phase one guide to farmers and growers uh, which picks up that it obviously can include things uh, such as access way or services, um, fencing, uh, uh, changes to facilities and such like. And obviously the, 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 the purpose of these works are to reduce the effect of severance or the injurious affection on land and, and consequently that would also reduce the, the compensation that would otherwise be payable for, for those effects. And Colin, that's just the, the, the key question here is really, you might be able to say, well, the value of the farm is X and when it's severed, that has this effect but how do you work out what how does how do you work out the value of accommodation works or how how the accommodation works play out into the compensation claim mm. um i think could if i it's a good question i'll just refer to something simon talked about earlier on is how to keep a can get in early and keep in a um, continuous dialogue with the acquiring authority, whether it's a new road, a railway, whatever. Because the impact, let's assume it's a farm for the moment, um, because a lot of severance is related to agricultural holdings. And the impact on a farm, if it suffers from severance with a, a railway or a road going quite slap bang through the middle of the farm, can be significant. I mean, it depends on the circumstances, but how is the claimant going to access his severed land once the ra railway or road is built? Um, is, it, is it going to con be convenient? Does it allow the operations to continue reasonably? Um, and does it make common sense? Now, if you get in early at the environmental impact stage, advising a client, um, you can you can get to know the way his his farm operates, and you can respond at the earliest stage, and and where that impact is significant. For example, you know, a hundred acres or more, you know, loads of land is severed from the main farm. Um, then you can you can get in and say, well, there has to be a bridge or an underpass linking these two sides and you can discuss its best location and everything else that will mitigate against that. Once the claim comes in and the scheme's designed, very often it's too late to do this. So, you know, people who are involved in these sorts of schemes and advising clients must get in early. Then how do you, how do you assess whether accommodation works are worthwhile? Really depends I think upon obviously uh, the size and nature of the holding and how much land is severed. Um, you've already referred to small parcels of land, um, but it, it, if there is only a small element 
let's say, an acre uh, that is severed, um, the claimant can, well, firstly, it doesn't make sense for the acquiring authority to build a bridge or underpass just for that purpose. The value for money argument will not go through. Um, a bridge or underpass could cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. So it has to be um, reasonably related to the impact that it is seeking to um, uh, mitigate. So um, get in early, but realize that small areas of land can um, not really reasonably uh, incur huge costs just to access them. However, um, on, the, on those cases, if it's no longer reasonably capable of being farmed, then claim can be put in for the acquiring authority uh, under the 70, 1973 Land Compensation Act to um, acquire the hull if it's no longer reasonably capable of being farmed. Um, the whole of the severed land, sorry, not the whole of the farm, the whole of the severed land. Um, and so that's that's another area to go to go forward on. Um, does that answer most of the questions? Sorry, I hope I've um, I've tried to answer. Um, the impact obviously will depend on the way in which the scheme actually affects the holding. Um, if, for example, it will still, despite the mitigation, cost more to operate the farm, that is something that could be looked at. But generally speaking, uh, the, the methodology would be to look at what a prospective purchaser of the farm um, would, uh, uh, would actually offer for the with scheme and without scheme farm. And where there is additional loss due to severance, then that would be allowed for. But we must be careful not to conflict severance with disturbance. I mentioned additional access costs. In other words, extra cost of getting to a, a severed property. And, you know, that if we're going to accept severance, then there won't be a claim for additional access costs. Indeed, the tribunal tend to want the losses generally assessed on a sort of price per acre or disturbance and not a disturbance basis but on an injury to land and that's what we're talking about. Yeah, so to put that in very simplistic terms from a lawyer's perspective is it that essentially that what you do is say what's the value to the open market purchaser of a farm which has contiguous fields that they can access from field A to field B uh, without restriction versus what's the value to the open market purchaser of a farm which only has one point of access i.e over an overbridge uh yes and if there is a if there is a difference and can be demonstrated to be reasonable um then that is payable in addition to the value of the land taken thank you John. and you, you mentioned obviously about uh, value of the claim versus cost of the accommodation works and we've just got up on screen just to complete this section section 83 of the 1965 act where we've seen section 82 uh, which talks about where the owner can compel um, the acquiring authority to buy small parcels of land and section 83 is essentially a bit of a protection for the acquiring authority where they're being asked to provide accommodation works in the scheme for land that would otherwise be very small parcels. Mm -hmm. So I think that brings on, we can probably take disturbance costs at a, a bit of a, a bit of a canter, Colin, because you've already oh. touched on them to some degree and, and Simon touched on them as well in, in his presentation. So obviously these are costs or losses that arise from compulsory acquisition and dispossession, but are not directly based on the value of land. Um, Shunfeng is our key uh, case there in terms of what you've got to demonstrate direct and reasonable consequence arising from the acquisition not too remote and the claimant must act in a reasonable manner and mitigate their losses um, in terms of basic approach uh, to, to bring a claim for disturbance uh, under, under this head at least so rule six the claimant must be the occupier of land they must and they must have an estate or interest in land that's been compulsorily acquired and just to flag there that there can be difficulties where the ownership of the legal interest differs from the legal person 
in occupation and there's, there's quite a lot of case law that has covered this issue of can you pierce a corporate veil can you attribute occupation to um the, the part of the legal interest can you is there an assumed legal interest so a bit too complicated to cover in in the context of today's presentation but there's quite a lot of case law about that um but also just to note in that context there's obviously if, if you are a person in occupation uh, but you don't have a legal interest or a state in the land uh, there may be a claim for compensation under section 37 of the 1973 act um, and just finally obviously for a claim in good disturbance in this context you must have lost possession as a result of the compulsory acquisition of the land a final important point here is to bear in mind that if you're making a claim for disturbance costs the claim for disturbance costs cannot be inconsistent with the basis on which the land acquired was valued um, and again Simon touched on this briefly but if you want to put your claim for compensation uh, on the basis of the value your land has as potential development for housing um, you can't then seek disturbance costs based on dispossession for for existing use to, to put it bluntly um, because you would have had to give up that use essentially or incur those removal costs in order to realize the the development value you're seeking. Colin, does that sound broadly about right? Was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I, in terms of legal, I think that's absolutely spot on. Thank you, Colin. And just very finally on, on this point, potential heads of claim. Again, Simon's touched on some of the issues to deal with valuation and evidencing. Mm. Um, Colin, was there anything in particular you wanted to, to, to pull out from a practical perspective, from, from your perspective as somebody who's dealt with a lot of these claims, mm where the the key issues tend to come up or where the problems tend to arise on disturbance claims either in terms of lack of evidence or real points of dispute of principle right uh, thank you and i'm glad you mentioned that i think evidence is the key thing we must remember that it, the onus is um, burden of proof is on the claimant to produce evidence of losses where a disturbance is a loss in the first place so um the advice is for a surveyor doing this is to keep as many records as possible and to make sure your client keeps records of what it what has happened and what it has is going to happen when from when he becomes um uh, appointed because uh, it is the evidence that will help determine the claim at the end of the day um so that's most important i, I think rather than going through these i think these are pretty well known i'd just like to raise a couple of points um tax has been a, a, a real issue um that was raised with um hs2 on um agricultural land because when the land is sold for compulsory purchase it um it, it, it's not sold and it it creates problems in it could create problems in terms of tax because it could be that the landowner has to pay capital gains tax on the sale and then uh, the question of claiming for compensation for tax that would otherwise not have been payable had part of the land been sold privately comes into force and i just emphasize here that um at the clients need advising that under capital gains tax which generally is the one that is um, high on their list. Uh, they can, of course, under the rollover relief, under a capital gains legislation, reinvest in either other land or other investment in the holding that it may not be land, it could be buildings or machinery. Um, so actually um, achieving a claim in the tribunal on potential loss of tax can be very difficult and remote and i think the most important thing is to advise your clients to look carefully at reinvestment uh, wherever possible we know that's not uh, you know it's not easy with agricultural land but that that's a, a point that i would just raise um i think i don't know how much time we've got um but um also the consistency point is is also important when we're looking at uh, section 10a claims for reinvestment costs and as, as, as a disturbance claim again um, the consistency argument needs to come into play it, this is a 
claim for compensation uh, for disturbance and we can't be valuing the land for example for development um, uh, if indeed um, we're talking about reinvesting the money um, so I think it has to be so we can't we, we must be consistent with the main way that the land is 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 valued and whether the disturbance uh, uh, claim applies under the Horn v Sindeland principle. Well thanks very much for that Colin I think uh, on that we will hand over now to uh, Luke for a brief look at injurious affection where land isn't taken compulsorily and tenant compensation. Well, thank you very much, Jacqueline. I will try to get through these uh, fairly briefly. We've already heard mention of the injurious affection which, uh, type of injury which can arise in the severance context under Section 7. Section 10, which I've put on the screen there, deals with a slightly different position. This is the position where your land is injured and none of it is taken effectively. There are broadly two categories of case where an injurious affection claim can arise. The first is where none of your land has been acquired, but the acquiring authority has taken some other land, has carried out works on that other land, and as a result of those works has uh, caused damage to your property or reduced its value in some respect. So that's the, that's the first type of situation where this can arise. The second occasion where this can arise is where as a result of the acquisition of some other land, you've lost a proprietary but non-possessory right. What I mean by that is it's a right which passes with the land. It's not a purely personal license, but it's not a right which allows you to have possession in the legal sense. You're not occupying as a tenant or occupying as a freeholder, for instance. Classic example of a proprietary non-possessory right is an easement, you know, a right of way or something like that. If you have a right of way across a field which is attached to your land, you don't own the field but the uh, field is taken for the compulsory purchase as a result your right of way is extinguished then the loss of that extinguishment will be picked up by section 10 as well helpfully uh, in the case of wild tree lord hoffman in the house of lords gave a summary of the key principles which apply to injurious affection. I, I can't do much better than to set out in bullet point form Lord Hoffman's uh, five key observations. The first one we've talked about, no need for any of the claimant's land to have been taken. The second is an important point. This is that if you want to test whether or not you're going to be entitled to a section 10 uh, compensatory payment, ask yourself this, if the uh, occurrence which gives rise to the compensation claim had occurred without statutory protection, would you have a valid private law claim for either public or private uses? If the answer is yes, and if that private law claim would fail because the acquiring authority has an absolute defence of statutory authorisation for what they have done, then you are within Section 10 territory. It's effectively designed to replicate a nuisance claim where that defence exists. Point three uh, is a corollary to that, which is that Section 10 is only engaged where the authority acts under its statutory powers. If your land's damaged by the authority doing something which is not authorised by the statute, if it's gone beyond its powers in some respect or is using some extra private law uh, rights to give effect to its scheme, uh, then Section 10 is not engaged and you may need to bring a private law action in that situation. Uh, point four we've already touched on, it's only land interests we're concerned with, a, a purely personal contractual right which just happens to relate to land won't be covered by this. So a, a contractual right to move over someone's land isn't under Section 10. A full easement is because the, an easement is a, a right in land, the former is not. And the final point is that Section 10 is only concerned with injury arising from the construction of the uh, or the execution of the works themselves. 
if after the execution is finished, there's some lingering uh, diminution in the value of your land from the ongoing use of the fruits of the works, that is beyond the scope of section 10. So that I hope is a, a very potted summary of injurious affection. I'll finish then with section 20, tenant compensation. Section 20 is aimed at, at short tenancies, effectively. I've put up the, the, main, uh, the main provision from section 20 there. And as you'll see, it's concerned with compulsory purchase where a person has no greater interest in the land than as a tenant for a year or from year to year. So you're primarily concerned with periodic tenancies or with very short ones under a year long. I've put up there the key types of tenancy uh, that will be caught by this. If you've got a term certain of a year or less, you're obviously in. Uh, any term certain with a year remaining or less than a year remaining on it can be brought within scope of section 20 as well. Any periodic tenancy where the period is a year or less is within. And finally, a tenancy at will is within scope as well. Although the value you'll get for the loss of a tenancy will, at will will probably be extremely low because uh, as, as we know, the defining characteristic of a tenancy at will is that the landlord can bring it to an end immediately. So, you know, if you have a right which can be ended tomorrow, then the loss of that right is, uh, is not something which is particularly value significant uh, in open market value terms. It may have sentimental value or something like that, but that's of course not what the scheme is aimed at. As to the compensation you're actually entitled to under Section 20, as with, uh, as with CPO compensation, generally you've got two limbs. The first is compensation for the value of the residue of the tenancy. You know, if you're on a 15 year tenancy with six months to run, you're compensated for the value of the six months left on your, on your fixed term tenancy. If you're on a periodic tenancy, then you assume determination at the first opportunity. You work out the amount of notice the landlord would have to give to end your periodic tenancy. And that amount of notice gives you the length of time which the valuer is valuing for compensation purposes. And of course, disturbance payments are available under Section 20 as well. In the case of a, of a very short, easily determinable tenancy, so a, a periodic monthly tenancy or something like that, or a tenancy at will, the bulk of the recoverable compensation is probably going to be disturbance uh, payments rather than uh, land value payments, if I can put it that way. Final point to mention on all of this is the role of the 1954 Act. The fact that you don't have very long left on your tenancy uh, may not render it as non-valuable as, as it would otherwise be if you have a right to renewal under the 1954 Act and the loss of that right to renewal is something which should be wrapped up in section 20 and can turn what would otherwise be a fairly low value claim into something slightly more significant. So that's a very brief potted rundown of section 20 for you as well. I will now pass you back to Simon who's going to talk about part one claims. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, Luke. I'm going to deal with part one extremely briefly because we're very short of time. Uh, the com claims under part one of the 73 Act uh, arise where uh, uh, physical factors um, caused by, uh, arise uh, caused by the use, of public, the use of public works following their construction, their alteration or a change in their use. And the claim uh, that for compensation is for compensation in respect of land depreciation. So this is a claim that fills gaps. No land need be taken. Uh, it, it's not uh, injurious, it doesn't involve injurious affection caused by the execution of works, it's about the use of works. Um, and it involves a situation where, as Luke was referring to earlier, um, you, you can't uh, maintain a nuisance claim because of the statutory defence. So the, the physical factors uh, that are capable of generating a part one claim are noise, vibration, smells, fumes, smoke and artificial lighting and discharge onto the land in respect of which the claim is made of any solid or liquid substance. So those have to be the causative uh, factors. 
uh, and they must emanate from uh, from uh, the from the land uh, that it, that is the subject of the works, except in the case of um, aircraft uh, landing in and out of aerodromes, where they de where they de where the the noise arising from flights is deemed to arise from the use of the land itself. There's an exclusion in respect of physical factors which are caused by accidents. So, for example, car accidents uh, on a highway or, or accidents involving aircraft. Um, uh, the, 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 those are expressly excluded from this scheme. And the public works are any highway or aerodrome or other works on land, uh, not being a highway or an aerodrome, provided for or used in the exercise of statutory powers. Who can claim? Uh, well, the interest must have been acquired before the public works are first used, or in the case of a highway, it's first open to traffic. But that's not to say, Fallows, uh, that um, it's a person who buys the property, highway works having commenced, wouldn't be entitled to maintain, is not entitled to maintain the claim. So in other words, the claim is crystallized by virtue of the, uh, of the subsequent um, uh, opening of the scheme. Uh, and the acquiring authority are not in effect left off the hook by virtue of a transfer of ownership prior to that. Uh, and um, as far as claimants are concerned, dwellings can be subject of, of these claims either by virtue through the freehold owner or somebody owning a, a tenancy of uh, more than of at least three years to run at the date of the claim. Uh, and but there are restrictions on other occupiers, although um, an agricultural unit holder can make a claim. And, and the claims crystallize um, 12 months after the date on which the highway is open to, if you're taking a highway case, uh, after 12, 12 months after the highway opens, or, or, the, or, or the works are chain, or there, or, or there are alterations or a change of any change of use. That is called the first claim date. And as we were talking about, speaking about previously, reasonable valuation and legal expenses are, are recoverable as part of this claim. So crystallization of this is 12 months after opening. And the compensation payable under part one is, as I said earlier, in, depreci in, is in respect of the depreciation in value of the claimant's interest in land. It's not a general, it's not some kind of general um, uh, impact on amenity or enjoyment of the land. It's a specific depreciation in value ahead of claim. Uh, and, and the works to be taken into account are to take into account rather the use of the public works on the first claim day and any intensification of use that is to be reasonably expected. So that there's a crystallization of the claim, um, rather like a CPO situation, and it's made as at a, and the award is, is, is made as at a specific date, anticipating uh, future events in intensification in particular. And um, there are specific provisions within the uh, Land Compensation Act Section 5 that are deemed to apply, and those are listed there. And those express planning assumptions, um, which, which are to say that I'm just supposed to assume the existing use and buildings, except I may take account in some circumstances of rebuilding, maintain, maintenance or alteration and improvement of buildings or the subdivision of a large house. And uh, that unimplemented permission is to be left out of account for this purpose. And so, so far as these claims, are, these specific claims are concerned, because they're very, um, very specific, um, they relate to uh, they, they relate to the land um, that is that, that is injure, that is affected by the operation of the, the of the public works. But there's a set off provision. You should never be recovering um, additional compensation not properly due. So so there's a set off for the increase in value of land to which the claim relates, or other contiguous or adjacent land to which claimant is entitled in the same capacity. And because two, two adjectives are used there, contiguous or adjacent, um, adjacent has to in effect be given an expanded meaning. And so adjacent is, is, is considered deemed to refer, mean close to for this purpose. And then there are specific further provisions relating to double recovery. So I can't, for example, uh, recover um, uh, I can't recover under claim one where I've already recovered in respect of the same land 
uh, for, for injurious affection, for example. But on the other hand, if the public works that are not on the land that was taken from me, but on other land, I can still make that claim um, clearly as far as that is concerned. And so that is a very quick romp through part one claims, a very specific beast. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, apologies, we've obviously run over a little bit on our time today. Uh, we have had a few questions come in during the session, so we will uh, send out a, uh, a brief uh, response to those questions to all participants uh, via email uh, later on this week. Um, I, I hope that has been a, um, a useful uh, brief uh, trot through uh, the, the issues that may come up uh, when considering or assessing a compensation claim. Uh, hopefully we'll have conveyed our enthusiasm for an interesting and complicated subject by the amount of time we've taken to go through what was a brief overview. Um, but as I said, we thank you very much for attending today, particularly given uh, the, the date in August, uh, and we will be sending out um, a brief follow-up after this session, uh, picking up on a few of the questions we had via the Q&A chat during the presentation today. It just remains for me to thank all of the speakers today, and again to all of you for attending and wish you a very pleasant summer. Thank you very much. <laughs>